Let's see here. Thing. It promises new technology, but it's failing me in Moss right now. <laughs> I hate my phone today. We Dude, all have like it work. Like Holy cow. It is. It's going to work. i would be live on Facebook, too. That ought to be interesting. So I'm glad all you guys took the time out of your night to join in here. And I will tell you that this is being recorded. So anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Just <laughs> Some people ain't gonna think that's funny, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself. Right, there you go. <laughs> okay, so we have I had a, um, an, a, a conference call with the, with the true folk down in Southern California who I absolutely love, every one of them. And we did a, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were talking and we uh, had an idea come to my mind about uh, what we're really looking at with regards to our faith. There's patterns all through the Lord. There's patterns all through everything we read in the, in the relations of people. There's patterns of actions. There's, there's patterns of success. And I know Dan Pena is a big fan of that. Success leaves clues. And he's absolutely right. It doesn't matter how anybody got to the top. If you follow that same pattern they do, if you work as hard as they do, if you put what it takes into it, you're going to be successful. That means a 16 hour day. That means a seven, you know, 18 hour day, seven days a week. Um, that means sleeping in your office. Success leaves clues. People don't like Israel. People don't like the fact that, well, that may not really be a race. That's a religion. How come they get their own? There's all kinds of ideas that go behind that, but they're successful. People don't like the fact that the Indians have casinos, but they're successful. People kind of look askance at the Mormons, but they're successful. Success leaves clues. And we're kind of in the same boat right now. And all of a sudden, in the middle of figuring all that out and looking at it and say, hey, you know what? Maybe we got an opportunity to be successful as well. Um, we get this disease that comes along. And that's kind of a weird thing. No, we, we, well, now what? Somebody threw a wrench in our plans. Everything, all those established success leaves clues models and all the political and financial infrastructure and the economies, all of that's been put into question. Everything we rely on to build that success for ourselves, all of a sudden, well, that doesn't really work anymore. Not everybody can go to work. Not everybody can sleep in the office. Not everybody can do all those things they need to do to be successful the way everybody says we need to be successful. Now, I'm just going to tell it to you right now. If your faith is not encouraging you to be everything you can be or giving you a foundation from which you can jump forward and become something more than you were before, you're wasting your time. You're in the wrong place. And that's going to be honest with you. Any man that's come out of prison and found a better way to live and is still out of prison and doing well and holding a job and making money and raising a family and buying a home, that's success. Any man that's doing a little bit better today than he did yesterday because of the way he believes, that's success. Now, I've heard people say, also true has zero to do with success. The fuck it don't. If you can't live it, if you can't use these principles to be better tomorrow or today than you were yesterday, what are you doing here? I've got a kind of a high standard of the people that I want to associate with because I want people that are willing to step up and become something more. All of a sudden that's been put into question. Now what? Well, I got to looking at it and I was thinking about it when it first happened, everybody's told to stay home. And I was real, I played a couple of videos because people are calling me, people are concerned. Are they gonna let us all die? Are we all gonna get sick? How many of us are gonna die? What's gonna happen? Everything's in chaos. You can't go to work, you can't make money. How am I gonna make it? What's gonna happen? First off, you gotta really look at it. If you've made it this far in life, you've probably made it through some tough times before. Ain't no reason in the world to believe you ain't going to make it again. Yeah, there's some uncertainty, but it's a real good shot, real good chance. You got what it takes to do it one more time. That's all it takes. Do it one more time. Do it for five more minutes. Take one more breath. Put one foot in front of the other for one more step. That's what it takes right now. But by the same token, we need to realize, and I've said it for a long time, when the gods again become involved in the affairs of men, Shit goes sideways for people. 
Usually we look at it as a Greek tragedy or all these other things that have failed when the gods again become involved in the affairs of men. I don't care what religion you're following. Things go south quick for your average Joe. And in the middle of all of this, our gods have thrown us a lifeline. Indeed, all of these pagan faiths have thrown the adherence to such ideologies a lifeline. They said, go home. Well, now I'm trapped in my own. Honey, you're trapped in the foundation of everything good that comes from in your world. Where you are is where everything good, positive, and powerful originates. Those little shrines we build in our home, where we put those special things, those things we believe in, those pictures of our ancestors, all of that stuff we love and hold dear, that every time we walk back, we're reminded of those gods that told us, go to your house and be safe. Hey, that's so now we're in a home. We're with the people that we're supposed to be for whatever reason. And now we have a chance to cultivate the foundations of this faith. Now it's getting scarier, isn't it? So let's take a look at what that really means when you want to believe in these gods. Because we're not sitting here saying, you know, Jesus is going to come down and save us. We're sitting here thinking all the time, saying, well, I'm supposed to have what it takes to make it through this. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that feels like. What's the image of that look like? Well, let's take a look at what these gods really look like. Let's take a look at a pattern that I see again and again in all of this stuff. Now, if Odin makes all these sacrifices, travels all the time, makes sacrifice, sacrifices an eye, sacrifices his ego to become worthy to rule the kingdom he built. That's an interesting thing to understand, too. I'm sure there's a video on it somewhere, and if it ain't, damn sure a book I wrote about it. His partner is Frigga. Frigga, the goddess of the hearth that knows everything, that weaves all of these wonderful strands, these clouds, that weaves these bonds of love between people. Make sure we're connected in the right spot with people. That's an interesting dynamic pair, isn't it? Odin and Frigga, Odin and Frigg. This wonderful, beautiful power couple, quiet, beautiful, demure, noble born lady, powerful, handsome king, whose visage is terrifying to look upon if you cross him. So we all wanna be, isn't it? We wanna exemplify that idea. What do they bring into the world? Because you see this pattern in the Rigs Thula where each generation has the basic set of skills, lives in a simple hut with a cloth over the door, and they have a son, they give her a wife. Those grandchildren are all named amazing things. Now, some people would say, well, that's the race of beings. Well, no, that's the generation that built the foundations of the civilization upon which the next generation does it better. Next generation Rig comes to visit a little bit better. They do a little bit better. Third generation he visits, the mother and the father, well, they're doing a little bit better too, ain't they? Now they have true skills. Now they have, now they're the ruling class. Now they are the people that are building empires, and building a civilization worth living in, to living in that civilization, to being successful, to becoming the rulers of their own domain. And they learn the language of the birds. They learn the use of the runes. They work for and they earn the right to be called Rig himself. That pattern repeats in the divine. Not only does it repeat amongst men, our children should do better than us if we teach them right, raise them right, love them. <coughs> if you look at Odin and Frigg, who is their son? Balder. In the most beautiful of halls where the fewest baneful runes exist, a great golden and glittering hall, and his wife is Nana, this perfect mate, with a true and pure love. Their son is Forseti. Forseti puts to sleep all suits, justice, right action. Something men can believe in in the society they want to live in. So from that high-minded couple of these great ancient sky gods, Odin and Frigg, you have justice and right action brought into the world. Those kinds of things men need to believe in, so they might go out and try to become some, some success. That infrastructure that, that believes that every man is, there's a, there's a right and equitable settlement for all of these disputes. If you look at Niord, now people don't look very much at Niord, but if you look at what it says about him in the Gilfanning, it says he also has the power to work with fire and ice. That's an interesting thing to say about someone we don't talk very much. So we have Niord, his children, Frey and Freya, they represent the abundance and fertility of 
the world. Love, prosperity, that kind of environment that can thrive only in a just society. That vulnerability, that willingness to believe in love, that willingness to share in love, that willingness to bring children into the world, that kind of care, concern, that kind of love can only best thrive in a just society. A gift from Odin and Frigg, a gift from Niord. You have these two different classes of divine beings that create an environment, this tribe, this community we call the Aesir and the Aesir in Asgard, as above, so below. I don't care where you look at it, that's what it's supposed to be. All of a sudden, the infrastructure we were counting on, while it might be firing on all cylinders in many locations, in some locations it's beginning to fail. That economy, that just society we had so strongly hoped for, well, now all of a sudden we're not sure. We were told to go to our homes and cultivate our faith. When I look at the as Aesir and the Aesir and that generational prosperity of justice, of love and compassion and fertility, when I see that arising amongst the gods that I worship, pray to, and believe in, in my home, in the most desperate of times, I have an idea that what's going to change, what's going to come out of this, I'm going to be part of something different. If all of the coronavirus nonsense stopped right now, the world is still changed. And yet I do not yet see any of these pagan ideas, understanding that the technology that we have kind of shied away from or not really wanted to be a part of or found some reason not to do is there to allow us to no longer rely on someone else for the comfort of how we live. If I want to embrace a just society, if I want to create an environment where my wife might be able to express the beauty of who she is, where my daughter might grow up in a world where she is safe and secure and understands what love might really mean and what she might look for in a partner, where my sons might grow to be strong, powerful men in their own right. Maybe I need to quit exposing the vulnerability of who I am and allowing everybody else to take care of, of how I live in this world. Self-reliance, industriousness, and perseverance are not going to job and getting a better paycheck. Whatever happens from here forward, we are redefining what it means to be successful. I don't care how you look at it. The technology, the gifts are there within us, and the technologies are there for us to produce our own electricity. I don't care how you do it. I don't care if you use wind or water or solar, whatever. That technology is there. We can once again begin to look at growing our own gardens. But pay attention because all of that greatest generation that fought World War II, that went through the Great Depression, that fought World War II, that built America into what it is through the 50s and the 60s, they're gone. Our opportunity to collect and soothe that ancestral wisdom we let slip through our fingers. And now we've got to take a long, hard look at what it is. And our God said, go home and be by that shrine. Oh, now maybe I can cultivate some understanding. Now I can cultivate some depth of being. Now I can begin to see that I need to stop relying on the electric company who will cut it off in a heartbeat if I don't pay that bill. Maybe I need to stop relying on this, on this water system and maybe I can do a little bit better. And I assure you the technology is there for you to harvest your rainwater, to drill a well if you need to. Well, I can't do it because I live in the city. It's time to stop living in that city. Well, that's gonna to cost too much money. Yeah? How much it costs you right now for that uncertainty in your life? We're living in a period of transformation. We're living in a period that's going to require radical actions for some of us. We're living in a time right now where some of us are going to feel an enormous amount of pain. We have all kinds of good people around. I know I am surrounded by exceptional people who will be there for me in a heartbeat if I have to deal with that pain because they are sitting at their homes by their shrines, cultivating the depth of faith necessary to navigate these times. They are not asking for someone to steer the ship for them. They're saying, help me build a stronger fucking boat. That's where we're at. Our ability to rely upon ourselves for how we want to live, how comfortable we want to be, the food we want to eat, that's on us. 
it's time to relearn some of that stuff. You go to the grocery store and the shelves are empty. Now what? Well, I didn't grow a garden this year and I didn't want to raise a calf because it was too much work because I was too busy trying to make a living. I got a paycheck and I paid the bills, but you know, there's that one. I, God, that's going to be tight, isn't it? Is that how we're supposed to live? I see that picture all the time. We're not built to live like that. And we let the greatest generation slip away from us without ever understanding or har harvesting the idea of Ansu's itself, the ancestral wisdom, so we might live under Othala in our ancestral homes. We let it slip away. Now we're sitting here going, okay, we got to make it through. Hard times create hard men. We're in that time now, we have the faith to become those kind of hard men that can do the things necessary to do. And it's gonna create a good time. It's gonna create prosperity and everybody's gonna have food. But these are the things we need to be thinking about. When I look at the generational ideas of the Riggs Thula, when I look at the generational ideas that are present among the Aesir and the Vanir and all those gods that we make offering to, I begin to find the infrastructure that I need to really take self-reliance, industriousness, and perseverance to another level. Maybe we might be in that time to do that. Who's suggesting we do that now? I've been saying, I'm gonna toot my own horn here because I'm big enough to do it. <laughs> I've been saying for a long time, I don't care what book you've read. You might read the book because that's not the wisdom. Socrates pointed that out, not me. Where are our spiritual leaders offering that encouragement? I see a lot of people stepped up to the plate so they could be in front of the crowd. Now when things get tough, I don't see people saying, you know what, buddy, I got you. Call me any time of the night. We'll get through this together. We'll make it happen. You know what? Hey, if you're having a hard time, give me a holler. I got some food set aside. I got cans and cans of food in there. Come by. I got you taken care of. This is where it's time to do that. If you have any kind of position of authority or responsibility, it's time to understand that people are uncertain. We have allowed ourselves to be, ex our flanks to be exposed by relying on other people for how we live in the world. And now all of a sudden we're caught. If we're willing to step up to the plate and help people make through that and show them the way, we are changing the world, whether you know it or not. It's time to step up and understand people are going to hurt. People are going to cry. You're going to have to deal with counseling people that are passing away. And it ain't going to be fun. And it ain't going to be pretty. And it ain't going to be no glory in it. But it's time to really knuckle down and become the men we keep talking about being on Facebook. The ability to do that successfully resides squarely in our ability to sit in front of our household shrine and understand that everything good that comes into this world emerges from the hearth of our individual homes. Every great good and positive action comes with how a child is raised. Are they capable of showing compassion? Are they capable of showing strength? Are they capable of bearing, un of bearing up under the weight of what's to come? Are they capable of standing on their own two feet? This is our responsibility now. The world is changing, folks. Our faith has given us the tools necessary to recognize what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. To be those kind of strong men necessary to stand up. There's a lot of good things coming in this world. We're going to have to make it through a little bit of a tough time. The best way to do that is to stay with that shrine at your house and share it with those people that you love. Do not be afraid to do that. They might take it wrong. They might get confused. There might be all kinds of misunderstanding. Never be afraid to do that. Never be afraid to show love and compassion for those people that may not have the same mindset you have. Understand that lore. Understand when you get in front of that shrine that these gods have built an environment in our thought process. If you take everything you read in the lore and simply break it down to thoughts, if you break it down to the idea of ego itself, if you break it down, if you take the mask off the face of that energy and begin to look at it and say, okay, in a just world, I have what it takes to love those people around me with everything I got and build them into strong, good people. My gosh, man, if you've got that in your faith, what in the world can stop you? It might be a disease you can't see. 
It might be some kind of bug you can't fight. You may not have the opportunity to indulge in the glory of a great victory or a fall or a, or a great death. But if you can do that, and I truly believe in no uncertain terms that our spirituality, our faith, these ideas that our ancestors used for thousands of years that provided millions of people with purpose, guidance, and direction before anything modern came along. It worked for them. It can work for us. I assure you, they enjoyed fairly comfortable lives, best they could at that time. Now, all of a sudden, we live in a world that has technology that will allow us to continue living in the same standard of living we have now at a fraction of the cost and be self-reliant, be industriousness, and persevere through even these toughest of times. When everybody else is losing their head, we have what it takes. Our gods have thrown us a literal lifeline to make it through the very toughest of times. And I challenge every man that steps up there on these social media platforms that wants to call himself a social media leader, start leading. Start getting out there and offering people hope. That great opiate of the masses, I don't care if you believe in it or not, people need it. People are looking up to you. It's time to step up to the plate. Because there's a damn bunch of us sitting here going, now what? What am I supposed to do? I'm not sure. Well, let's start by carving out a real good image of what it looks like to be a self-reliant, industriousness, industrious man who can rely on himself instead of somebody else for their comfort. And perhaps, maybe, just maybe, we can build that environment that is a just society where people might have the courage to love one another in a safe environment. And maybe we can stop thinking about what Nancy Pelosi's doing or some other buffoon in Congress. You know, honestly, if this goes on much longer, we're going to have, have a whole new bunch of congressmen and senators. That we're going to drain that swamp whether they like it or not. The coronavirus is going to do it for us. Holy cow, There's maybe there's a silver lining there after all. When you stop to think about it, folks, and you get your thoughts collected right, and you get away a little bit from the drama, the fear-mongering, the for-profit news, all of the stuff we're bombarded with every day. And you know what? We're bombarded with more information than we can reasonably process in any given day. If you're told to go by your house and sit in your shrine, by your shrine, and think about these kinds of things, Think about these kinds of thoughts and listen to people like Alan Watts and some of the higher minded philosophies and read on Plato and read these, this magnificent achievement of, of cultural integrity that shows up in, the, in our prose and poetic edda. Our, whatever you think about it, it's what we have. I don't care if you think it's too Christianized or not, it's what we have right now. And I think you honestly have it backwards. But that gives us some breathing room. That gives us some breathing room to make an intelligent decision about where we want to go in the world. What we want to be in the world. Do we want to continue to be that kind of eccentric character that's kind of on the outskirts of everything, on the fringe of society? Or do we want to finally step into that role where once again, men of great mental capacity and positive mindsets guided by ancestral faiths stand at the center of the ring and lead by example, because we have that opportunity right now. Not because somebody said we could, and nobody ever gonna say we could, but it's time to do. It's time to be bold. It's time to step up to the plate. Quit worrying about what you did in your past. Quit worrying about how you got here. Nobody gives a shit how you got here. What image you're gonna cultivate and share when you show up at the plate, that's what counts. What counts is when you hit a home run. We have an opportunity to hit a home run right now. This is our opportunity to demonstrate to the world that these individuals that we've looked at kind of out of the side of our eyes and kind of wondered about, all of a sudden, they seem to be getting along pretty good. And they ain't waiting on the probationary ideas that come with so much of the Abrahamic faiths of, well, if you're good enough, you'll be, if things, something good will happen. Uh, no, we're going to build something good of our own accord because we're, given the gifts necessary to make it through the times that we find ourselves in. It's time to cultivate those gifts. 
It's time to cultivate that image of what I'm going to look like when I get through all of this. It's time to cultivate that image of, I want those people that I love to look like this when they get through it too. It takes a lot of strength from a good man to be able to do that. This faith right here insists that we become those good men. Not only that, it gives us the tools necessary to do it. Every one of those gods represents an ideal or thought process we can do. And every one of them will feast at a table of a positive mindset if we give them the chance to do it. Positive mindset is not a train of thoughts like this where you take right here and put a positive thought in and all the rest of it's negative stuff about what you've done in the past. It's about taking that entire train of thought, just like that, and making sure that it's positive here, it's positive here, it's positive here, it's positive all the way through. And that ain't the easiest thing for many of us to do because we ain't never been able to do it. Have you ever seen it? Have you seen it on the news? Did you see it from your parents or grandparents? Do you see it from your neighbor? Do you see it among politicians? So we're cutting, we're, you have to be bold and, cut and develop new grounds, new frontiers, blaze new trails. But most importantly, I'll create a thought process where these ideas that these various gods represent to us might be able to sit down and feast at the table. All it takes is one negative thought. One son of a gun, well, you really ain't worth all this. I mean, who do you think you are to get up here and say all these things? I mean, you, you know, your mama didn't love you and your daddy left and you went to jail and you failed at this and you didn't do. That's Loki at Eager's Feast, people. We'll never forget that. When you look at Eager's Feast and you see all of these great, good, positive, powerful individuals sitting down to feast in the bounty of the sea, the sea represents that great frontier and depth of spirituality we are standing on the shore of. It's a time to dive into it is now. You're not going to be able to do it if you've got one negative thought sitting there shooting down every positive idea you have about yourself. So what if you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not the perfect image you see on L Magazine or GQ, who gives a shit? You can fix that. Dive into the depth of this spirituality and you get to do that sitting in the comfort of your own home. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can worry about. We could sit here and let it eat our lunch if we wanted to. But our gods give a shit. I don't care what anybody says. Our gods gave us the tools and they set an example worth emulating. Let's emulate that example. Let's not ever let our children lose the ancestral wisdom. Write it down, share it with them, teach them. That's what I'm gonna do. And when it's all said and done, I'll have made it through all of this. Of course, if I die, I mean, my books will go through the roof anyway. So I'm, either way, I'm good, man. I feel positive about all of it. <laughs> I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. I feel good. And I'm so glad everybody joined me. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? And bear, bear in mind, this is being recorded. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you. Taking the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> There's my thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And some people Brian, can you do you have the ability to see the live stream that's going on on Facebook at the same time? No, I don't. Are they grazing in hell? <laughs> I do see it. You've got a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, do you want to ask them if they have questions? I can read it to you. Yeah, if, if anybody on Facebook it. has a question, I'll answer that too. I'd be happy to talk. It's only eight o'clock. I mean, we got, we got a half hour. I really enjoyed your uh, your speech, man. Thank you I very much, really man. It. Good, good. That's what it's all about. We got to come up with some kind of idea to give us hope. You got a question? Awesome tonight, Brian. Really great. Thank you, Ron. What'd you say, Melissa? There's a question from Thomas Lewis on Facebook. He says, what's a good source for learning more about runes? It depends on if you're starting out or not. I'm not a big fan of people that coming into OS2 that immediately gravitating towards the runes. They're awfully powerful mm -hmm. things to deal with. And more often than not, what we end up with is people that, that, that want to use that as a shortcut. But Diana Paxson has written an exceptional book on the runes. And uh, of course, Edward Thorson is is pretty close to the source material for a lot of it. Um, so, rune lore, um, 
Dinah Paxson's book is, is really good. I enjoy it. Um, Great point, Brian. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you, man. <laughs> 20, 25 years, I, I, I've been calling myself an Odinist, and I am just now grasping the massive uh, mysteries of the runes. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say start with the lore. Get, get the, the, get the stories of the heroes and the gods and goddesses and let the runes come to you as they may. That's a, you know what? He, you said it right there. Build that framework of yourself that has the capability to handle what they are. And, that, and it comes from understanding the lore and learning those stories in our sagas. It's, it comes from building that framework of yourself and your thought process of being able to properly utilize what they represent. And, and, um, you know, I wrote a little bit about him, but not much because it's just such a – people, I mean, people come in – People. nobody shows up to the door of any church because everything's going hunky-dory in their life. I don't care if it's here. I don't care if it's the church downtown. Nobody shows up because everything's going good. They show up because something's wrong in their life. And, and sometimes people get tripped up. Now, I'm not saying don't look at them. I'm just saying sometimes people get tripped up when they show up here and say, you know what? That rune looks like I might be able to sidestep this idea uh, because I don't want to take care of the details of my life. And I don't, I don't want to sound like an ass, but I got to be honest about all of it. And sometimes that's what we come across. And, uh, but they are, they, there's a lot of, um, if you want to meditate with them in Galder, there's a lot of, there's a lot of real powerful positive energy that can come with it. But, it's kind of like Will said, start with the lore. You've got to be able to build the framework within your thought process and the capabilities of, your, of who you are to be able to uh, properly utilize that in your life. And sometimes that might mean um, taking a good inventory of who I am. What's my failures? What's okay. What do I keep thinking that for? Okay. I need to deal with that and maybe not let that have such a prominent position in my life anymore. Um, okay. What about how I relate to this individual? Well, I'm kind of scared of that. He's a little bit better than I am, and it intimidates me, and it brings out some real negative aspects. Maybe I need to deal with that, take a real honest look at what that's doing. Okay, why? I'm, that girl might break my heart, so I'm not even really going to try. Um, maybe I need to deal with it. See, there's a lot of things in our lives we got to take an inventory of and get rid of some of that garbage. I mean, we showed up here because something's going not right, you know, uh, Take an inventory of who you are. Get rid of some of that garbage. Write it down and burn it if you have to. I don't care how you do it. But get rid of some of that garbage that's holding you back. Because I promise you, in the midst of all of this spirituality and faith that we want to call also true, and indeed any of those pagan faiths people wish to adhere to, there's a framework and a tool set there that will allow you to leap. I mean, not just take a step forward, but to leapfrog into new and more powerful success and images of who and what you want to become. Get rid of the garbage first. Get rid of those shortcomings. Take a powerful, positive inventory. Be honest with yourself. Honesty and courage are at the top of the list of the nine noble virtues for a reason. Be honest about who you are. Have the courage to say, that's my shortcoming. I'm going to deal with that. And then do it. Because there's an immense freedom that comes with all of this. Ask any of the men that have done time when they come out and they stick with this and they work hard and they figure that framework out. There's a freedom they can't, they never thought, would, they never imagined. Same thing for soldiers. Same thing for those women that have been in abusive relationships. Same thing for those children that grew up in bad homes. Same thing for people that have a broken heart. There's a freedom here people can't begin to imagine. And it's all bound and wove together with love. And that's that's a hard thing for people to want to admit. But there's a lot of good people around me that I care immensely about that I would fight for. As a man, that might be the best I can do. I'm, I'm, the only thing I can ever do is I'd fight for. Maybe it's just that simple. You know? Good point, Will. You got me fired up. <laughs> <laughs> you ready for another question? Yeah, let's get it on. Okay. One is, what is the spiritual significance of May Day? That's a question from Terry Clark. Of May Day? Yeah, do we have a spiritual significance for May Day? That's what he's asking you. Oh, yeah. That's where the young couples weave those bonds of love and frith and, <laughs> and come together. <laughs> that's right after Walpurgis Night. My nest, okay. And I don't know that that's even really a thing, but we sure do it. And then May Day, we, we have that great big pole and we 
dance around and weave those bonds and the last two people standing, well, that's going to be the, the promised couple for the year and they're going to be celebrated. Yeah, there's a lot of fun to be had with it. You know, there's a, it requires a lot of research. I mean, that's my kind of understanding of May Day. That's the new spring. That's new life. That's, that's love blossoming. I mean, that's what it is to me. Of course, I could be wrong. I'm sure there's other people that know more about it than I do. Well, you gotta think they were in quarantine and they would come out and that would be the first time they would see the opposite sex. You know, well, Ooh. not in quarantine, they were in winter, but the, you know, there's some significance there. Shoot, yeah, I'd put a leash on them too. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we still have a quarantine this May Day. <laughs> Don't talk to anybody, hang on to this rope. Let's walk around this pole for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, what do we got? We got another one, Melissa. Yes. Um, you got a question from Amy Christine. She says, "What practices do you have? Uh, you flip your thoughts from when you are when you're in a negative thought process." I reach. I call somebody. I mean, sometimes it's sometimes it's it, you just got to stop, but. I heard it best described by Alan Watts when cultivating a meditative mind state. So what we have to realize is that um, we're all, if you've ever seen someone die, you realize that in one moment there's something there about them and in the next moment there's not. Okay, so there's an energy there that everybody kind of understands. And we don't really know how to put that in the proper framework or the terminology without it sounding weird. But, but if you've ever seen someone die, you understand what that looks like. We're all so much more than the sum of our thoughts. So Alan Watt said it, and I thought it was brilliant, and because he, he was, but he said, when you're cultivating a meditative mind state, don't try to stop your thought process, because you can't. He said, what you need to do is recognize that those thoughts are so many birds chattering outside the window. You are the, the mind behind what your eyes see. There's a real powerful idea that comes with that because that means I don't have to wrestle with those thoughts anymore. Now I can separate myself and those are so many birds chattering outside the window and I can go on. The negative thoughts, one is we got to figure out where they come from. Who taught you to think that way? Who told you you weren't any good? Who told you you were a failure in life? Who told you you were too fat, too ugly? Who told you you were too snotty? Who told you that shit? And then begin to really look at it. Why would they tell me that? Because that's just the way I'm kind of analytical with those things. Who told you that stuff? Who told you not to believe in yourself? And then look at who taught you that and see where they got in life. And that's the surest fire. That is a surefire way, as far as I'm concerned, to shoot down a negative thought. I can get rid of that thing out of my mind in a heartbeat. Oh, well, I know where I learned that. How far they get in the world? Yeah. Okay, that explains a lot. Next, you know, and that's just kind of the way I am with it. Um, the positive thought process, once you cultivate that positive thought, there are people in my life that when I think about it, I smile. And that really helps. It wasn't always that way. I've been alone. I've been damned alone because I was a piece of shit. And I know what that feels like too. So when I find, think about some of those people in my life, man, I'm awfully grateful to have. That helps too. So try to cultivate that. Reach out, talk to people. Hey, um, I was thinking about you. I just figured I'd give you a call to see how things were doing. Who knows what kind of beautiful friendship might erupt from that simple phone call? Because I tell you, I've got several that started just like that. I was thinking about you. I wanted to reach out and say hello. Now, I don't know if it's because I've written a book or two, but uh, I think it'll work. And you know, they might be having a bad day. You might have an opportunity to be of service. You might have an opportunity to lend your might and main to someone else in that moment. That will knock out a negative thought in a heartbeat. That will make you feel like so much more. Try it. Next time you feel bad, next time you're not doing so hot, reach out to somebody you think highly of. Reach out to somebody that, not because, <laughs> tell it, just start just like that. I was thinking about you. I wanted to call and say hello, see how he's doing. Now, that's a little bit old-fashioned. I will grant you that, but it works. So those are my suggestions on that. 
What's the next one? We've got one from Chad Creel. He says, when setting up a home altar, should you purify the area beforehand in some way? And if so, how? I think you sage it. You can smudge it. You know, you can, you can hallow the ground with Thor's hammer. You can do, you know, the, the hammer right like we do for our <coughs> bloats. Um, you can do it every time you sit down there if you so desire. If that'll help you collect your thoughts when you sit down at your home shrine, then do that thing. Believe that it is sacred. Make it sacred. Do it daily if you have to. Pretty soon it'll take on a life of its own. And then it becomes something very special. Then it becomes something really special in your home. So yeah, there's whatever you feel does it best, do that thing. And it might be simply smudging it. It might be lighting a stick of incense. Uh, it might be any number of things. Hammer right is good enough. Out of the ground, out of the home. Um, you can um, you can walk the property line. You can claim the property too. You can walk the very property line, gall ring a rune, and put a stake with with those runes carved in at each corner of your property line, and um, work your way in. There's a lot to do with naming a with. Uh, Claiming. In some of the sagas, they would throw out a wood piece of wood, and wherever that washed up on shore, that's the land they would take when they when they began to migrate to Iceland. I don't know what saga that's in. I forgot which one, but anyway, that's kind of what I think. But it doesn't. It's never going to hurt to do it too often because it has a. When you go through those ideas of ritual, you're you are changing your very thought process. It's like. Um, I know this is going to be weird, but there's a lot of people that say that you can say positive thoughts or think positive thoughts around water and then freeze it and you have a much prettier crystal or something like that. And there's an idea that when you pray over food and you, and you, you hallow the food, it's going to have a more positive, nutritious effect when you eat it. I mean, there's a whole body of research on that stuff. So when you're, when you're doing those kinds of things around your own ritual, what you're really doing is not so much for that area. But it's more for your thought process. It's more for what you want to think and bring into the world. That's the power of your mind. You, anywhere you want to look, anything that's built, I got a hill back there. I got a huge factory and some water towers and a cell phone tower and a government tower with two-way communications and cameras and all kinds of not. That was a thought in somebody's mind before it ever became a reality. So when you sit down at that altar, what you're really doing it's not changing the structure of that shrine. You're altering the power of your own thoughts. And that's when you begin to realize that whatever ritual you wanted to cultivate to help you think along those lines um, makes it that much more of a beautiful thing. It makes it that holy place. That's where you're safe. That's where you're strong. That's important. Okay, next one. I think that might be it for questions. You got a lot of hellos though. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. I feel like I've just become King Kong because I see a guy down there at the bottom that I love the hell out of. <laughs> Glad you jumped in there, man. All right. I appreciate everyone's time this evening. And um, like I say, we have a lot of uncertainty in the world, but what we do have is the opportunity to cultivate in our homes that source where everything great and good might emanate into this world. So don't think of it as a prison. Don't worry about martial law. Let them do what they think they can do. When it's all said and done, the ones that are going to be standing the strongest are those that have what it takes to cultivate in their own homes that strength of character, that resolve, that determination, that love, and that willingness to protect it at all costs. We have what it takes. Let's just do it. I appreciate everybody joining in. All of y'all have a good night. And tomorrow's Monday. I don't know what you got going on, but grab it by the nose and whip its ass. <laughs> oh, I love you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. All right, y'all take care. Brian. I appreciate everybody. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, guys.